In sections 58 and 60 of Louis P. Bojum's Philosophy, The Quest for Truth, we explore the founder of the philosophical school of hedonism, Epicurus, and the French-Algerian-born existentialist Albert Camus, who believes that life is simply absurd. Epicurus lived from 341 through 271 before Common Era and was influenced in his thought by the materialist Democritus, who incidentally the one who first theorized the existence of the atom. Camus was born in 1913 in relative poverty in French colonial Algeria. He was a journalist, novelist, and a philosopher who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature for his novel The Fall in 1957. Another point of view we will explore is that of Chinese-centered Buddhism and how they feel the meaning of life is found. In Epicurus's arguments as to what constitutes a meaningful life, he first determines that happiness is the most important aspect of our lives. This is simply because when we have what makes us happy in our lives, we feel whole and content. But when it is missing, we seek it out at all costs. He then describes the lack of pleasure or happiness as pain, or the, and states that our lives are either in, at a content balance or in a state of seeking that which we are missing to be content. Only sensations of pleasure or pain truly affect human beings, and so only sensation categorized in these two broad subjective camps should concern us. Death, as it is not a sensation, should not be of a concern. Even the pain that may be experienced in anticipation of death is false pain, caused by fearing what should not be feared. Epicurus captures this idea in the eloquent phrasing, So death, the most terrifying of ills, is nothing to us. But when death comes, then we do not exist. So it, is not then, it does not then concern either the living or the dead, since the former, for the former it is not, and the latter are no more. And without the fear of death, the craving for immortality dissipates, removing the great pain in our life that it inspires. Of course, if we are to not to fear death, we are not to run to it either. According to Epicurus, life is an evil not to be is not an evil to be an es escaped, but is to be savored and experienced. To die well, one must live well. If one commits suicide, then mo the moderate hedonistic life, which brings forth moderation, balance, and by extension happiness, was not lived. Suicide, therefore, is never a good death. Desires are created by the lack of a corresponding pleasure. Hunger from lack of food. The, uh, the DTs from a lack of alcohol. Epicurus continues by saying that... <clears throat> that by understanding which of our desires are natural as opposed to selfish ones and which of the natural ones are necessary we can prioritize said desires and gain as much happiness from them as possible this must be coupled with two things one is the wisdom or prudence to know which desires should be sated when they should be sated and with which ones should be avoided entirely the second is a moderate life, so as to not desensitize oneself from the pleasures that may come as time goes by. By living in such a way, claims Epicurus, he shall live like a god among men, for a man who lives among immortal blessings is not like to a mortal being. Albert Camus, however, would argue that the true meaning in our lives cannot be found within sensation, but instead that life itself is absurd. He begins by examining suicide and declaring that because the stakes of the question are so high that it must be the most important philosophical question, is life really worth living? The connection between an individual's thoughts and suicide is hard to ferret out, as usually the only evidence left is the fact that the deed was done or attempted. Even when we know that what, what the stimuli is, example given a child's death, we still don't know what had caused his heart to answer our big question with, no, it is not worth living. Camus takes the tack that after we are wearied by the actions of mechanically living out our daily lives, we can step back and examine these patterns and their meanings by simply asking, why? This initiates the impulse of consciousness, or an awakening to perception outside the chains of automatic living. Many at this point slowly slide back down into the rhythms of the daily routine, but for some this is a true awakening. This will, according to Camus, bring one to the conclusion that through our limited lives, and because of entropy working on all our efforts to bring change in our lives, or beyond our lives, 
all is meaningless. And to be truthful, our actions must follow to either suicide or escape to a to escape a pointless existence or a kind of recovery or acceptance. Basically, the meaningless or absurd is in fact the meaning, and so that life may go on with large with a larger sense of irony. It will also go on ideally with the elimination of any expectations or preferences from life. Without a value set to determine such things, we must focus on getting as much good experience out of life as possible by remaining as aware and conscious as possible. Two may live, men may live the exact same life, but if one is fully aware and the other not, the former will have lived a fulfilling life despite having lived the same number of experiences. Camus puts it well that where lucidity dominates, the scale of values becomes meaningless. He uses the Greek myth of Sisyphus to illustrate the point of the absurd life. Sisyphus was condemned by the gods to eternally roll a rock up and down a mountaintop, up to a mountaintop, where it would then roll back to the base. The job, in fact the rock itself, is the burden of meaningless habits attached to life. They are necessary habits, but we can, and therefore cannot escape them, but doesn't diminish the, their meaninglessness anymore. To give up to the burden is to give up and kill oneself. But despite the meaningless nature of the task, Camus states that Sisyphus must be imagined as happy. Why is this? It is because the victor over the absurdity of life becomes his own master by conscious choice instead of being a slave to automatic living. Despite the absurdity of life, he may be victorious. Chinese Buddhism exposes that the meaning of life can be found by making oneself whole through active, meditative self-seeking. It, it is also important to avoid those parts of life that are distractions from our goal of completeness. Politics, sex, and money are all necessary evils for living in this world, but they are also examples of things which hold back the attaina, attainment of enlightenment. They are all, all simply illusions tied to sorrow that must be avoided by those who are seeking Buddha. The Buddha would agree with Camus' ideals of paying attention to life, and would agree that mortal human life has, was filled with meaninglessness, but necessary, meaningless but necessary rituals. He would also agree with Epicurus' example that the best life was humble and moderate, but would disagree with him that our lives are given meaning by daily sensation. Our sensation here is one of the traps of this illusion, and so must be escaped. All, I believe, hold small pieces of a larger truth, one that is espoused partly by theism and the core of mysticism, um, one espoused by the Buddha, one espoused by Camus by being completely aware as much as possible, and one espoused by truly experiencing one's life and one's experiences by Epicurus. So I think they all hold in agreement on my particular <laughs> point of view with the meaning of life, so I must agree with all of them. Uh, thank you.